Part 2. A School Do you know the only value life has is what life puts upon itself? And it is, of course, overestimated, for it is of necessity prejudiced in its own favor. Take that man I had aloft. He held on as if he were a precious thing, a treasure beyond diamonds or rubies. To you? No. To me? Not at all. To himself? Yes. But I do not accept his estimate. He sadly overrates himself. There is plenty more life demanding to be born. Had he fallen and dripped his brains upon the deck like honey from the comb, there would have been no loss to the world. The supply is too large. Jack London, The Sea Wolf. John 40, MK1 Gordon. He who dares to teach must never cease to learn. Richard Henry Dana Jr. Gordon was the perfect personality to organize and teach our group of eclectic non-rates. He was young, knowledgeable, and charismatic. In the first few minutes of our class, it was apparent the school would be very different than other areas of the Coast Guard. Our working chain of command stopped at a MKC who we would only see for administrative purposes. Otherwise, the MK-1 was our only supervisor. He had the authority to pass and to fail us. The training center enforced marching rules, and the MK-1 preferred not to march, so he allowed us to report in civvies most days. Obviously a history nut, Gordon seemed more like a National Parks interpreter than a Coastie, which was fitting at the training center in Yorktown, sandwiched between the York River and the Yorktown battlefield. I began to relax into the setting, glad to be off my extended leave, glad to be off the thrill, appreciating the humid hum of coastal Virginia. I pushed a mental reset button as I listened to my classmates give brief introductions. I gave mine in two sentences, and then MK1 Gordon gave his. Son of a gun. My name is Poor Jack Marshall Gordon, and I'll be your instructor for the next few months. My great 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 grandfather. Poor Jack was a merchant mariner on cotton ships back when the British wouldn't allow the colonies to produce their own textile fabrics. His schooner route was from Charleston to Bristol and onwards to Western Africa to use Africans as ballast on the way back home. During the outbreak of the Revolutionary War, my great-grandfather's ship was boarded by the Continental Navy of the newly formed United States of America, and he and his shipmates were pressed into military service. For the 18th century unskilled mariner, this meant being thrown and locked into the gun deck. The gun deck of a man o' war in 1775 consisted of a 40-foot long deck with four-foot high ceilings. Cannons would line both sides of the ship, ready to roll a thwart ship to the respective gun portals. Sailors pressed into service were not given the benefit of the doubt and were often locked into this tiny area for as long as they were needed for the war. Food and water being fed through portals in the deck. There, poor Jack lived for months rarely encountering the enemy, but ready to load and fire the cannon on command. In need of orders and provisions, poor Jack's ship, the USS Man of War, pulled into New York Harbor. The officers on deck followed the customs of the day and contracted prostitutes and our forced poor women to give the men in the hold their services. The women would then be locked on the gun deck for a useful amount of time. The offspring of such unions are considered sons of guns, and that's how my bloodline started. The story continues within the harbor. As an explosive sent my great-grandfather's ship to the sea floor, the survivors of this wreckage were picked up by the enemy, the English, and pressed into service once again on the opposite side. Poor Jack, however, was in no physical condition to serve. Having received major injuries to his legs, instead, the British set poor Jack to work at a local light station, what eventually became the Montauk Lighthouse. With a sailor's background, the British believed he would be an asset to help assist the ships navigating the coast. With prearranged light signals, poor Jack could distinguish the ship's flag and intent from a horizon away. The British ordered him, a seemingly sympathizer of the crown, to give light direction to the English and no information to the Americans. He did the opposite. To tie this story together, as poor Jack manned his light station, he was in a position which often witnessed shipwrecks. He developed a system to alert the local townspeople during these awful events to help rescue drowning passengers. This series of operations, Lighthouse Keeper to Life Saving Service, is the exact expansion of operations the United States Coast Guard followed 20 years later, 
from 1790 to 1915. During one terrifying episode, when a passenger vessel ran aground during a storm, poor Jack's call to the townsmen brought men and women. Amongst the responder was his dear lady of the gun deck with child in hand, a strange twist of fate. He married his gun deck lover and took his son of a gun as his own, which it may have been. The happy ending was not to be. Before the war stopped, poor Jack was found guilty of treason to the crown. He was hung on a gibbet by the entrance channel to the Hudson for all sailors to see. Gordon's family since has either been in the sailing industry or the prostitution one. The MK1's goal in the Coast Guard was to get stationed as the lighthouse keeper of the Montauk Lighthouse, which turned out to be in vain as the Coast Guard either privatized lighthouses or leased them to the National Park Service in 2009. Footnote 74. MK, machinist technician, the engine room experts. 75. Marching rules. Established procedures for uniformed personnel to move in formation, single file or as units. Cadence calling is necessary for larger units. 76. Portal. Corrupt it from port hole. A hole in a ship built to easily transfer cargo to and from a ship while in port. Port hole. Portal. 77. With the technology advent of wireless and satellite communications, more and more private, commercial, and industrial boaters are using private aids to navigation sources. The first major impact of this was the regulation and navigation equipment on the bridge of commercial vessels. Technology like radar, AIS, and VHF are all now mandatory, as per Coast Guard regulations. Additionally, more useful technologies like electronic charts and small phones have completely ruled out the need for many old Coast Guard aids to navigation, like light ships and Loran C. As the rate of technological progress continues, the Coast Guard will reduce physical structures, which often occupy premium and valuable property, an archaic aton. Lighthouses will become only tourist destinations. Paper charts will be stowed beside the sextant. Yawn 41. Ashore. Firemen. The fishing pier at Yorktown reached far enough out into the York River to see the Chesapeake Bay. A can buoy, number five, sat off the end of the pier and with the constant flow of water east had a permanent list to that direction. During the work week, I'd used the pier as an escape from the bar scene, which was just as exhausting as the barrack scene in San Diego. I'd met a non-rate, Fireman Avani, just out of boot, but was old enough and lonely enough to buy me booze. After a few weeks at school, we acquired fishing poles, and we would sit on the pier and cast out to the green number five for anything that would bite, mostly stingrays. The humidity and rolling storms inflicted beautiful havoc on my senses. Every cicada, thunder roar, and overturned maple leaf would grab some distant personal experience and force it into replay in my mind. It had been two years since I'd left Virginia. Reminiscing was inescapable. As I stared off over the wooden railing towards the river, Avani would get the clue and leave. The oceans were an hour and a half away, the mountains about the same. My mother was from the Appalachian Mountains, so as a kid, I spent more time there than at the beach. I loved both, though the suppressed access to the beach created a nostalgia for it. Each year, we'd load up the huge 15-passenger family van and drive south, swaying each time my father would swerve to pass a slower car to Ocean Beach on the south side of North Carolina and bunk in a house full of distant relatives. My father did not believe in air conditioning, so the approach to the beach was full of wonderful smells. The ocean, just like anything you're not accustomed to, had attributes that seemed far away and hard to name. Looking back, Approaching the beach house as a child was similar to a drunk approaching a bar and anticipating a drunk. Subtle, but true. The signal that good times were fast approaching was the smell of salt and sand. Low tide. On a conscious level, I was in awe of every aspect of the coastline. Each grain of sand, the tides, waves, horizons, skies, sounds, birds, fish, people, stores, the ocean, the ocean, the ocean. My desire for the sea was not lost throughout the year. On my parents' land, we had a creek and pond. My brothers and I were limited to the types of entertainment we had, so fishing was a natural favorite. This fishing interest carried onwards to other ponds, lakes, and rivers. 
The ability to navigate in dense woods and therefore navigate in general was something I educated myself on in the back country and rivers of Virginia. As I aged, the ideas religion presented and the way it grew over societies like ivy or like herpes grew more and more appalling. Not able to sport false and dehumanizing beliefs, I started looking for another spiritual relief, one that would be more productive. No tools in the bumfuck to guide, no literature readily available. I turned to bedroom philosophy and conscious conscious change, and I began to delve deeper with any information I could get. Music, the 60s, books, the transcendentalists, sex, absolutely none. Acme, yes. Penis in my hand, multiple times a day. Once I was goofing with some friends on the fall line of the James River in Richmond. In that area, the James drops some 105 vertical feet in the course of seven miles. This lends itself to great rapids, swirling pools, and high school kids doing unwise activities. It also lent itself to my group of friends traversing below a dam there. The dam rose 20 feet off the lower river level. Continually, by the second, millions of gallons pour over that dam. A tremendous amount of force propels the water a good three feet away from the concrete dam itself, leaving a tunnel from one side to the river to the other, which is a great spot for kids on drugs to transit. And there we were, including Anna, in a bikini with her skin and breast, cruising along this trippy path. Once to the middle, it was decided we would dive headfirst through the surging cascade of water. One after another, we all jumped through, tossed and turned in the thunderous whirlpool, and made it to the other side, except for Anna. I saw her dive in, saw her swirling around, saw her to continue swirling around. I thought not. Jumped into the roaring falls. She was there, stuck in current limbo. I reached out and grabbed her arm, found my foot on a hard surface, and pushed the both of us downstream towards our oblivious friends. Anna held me, her bikini breast against my chest and her lips close to my face. Oh my God, thank you. Months later, Anna had sent me an invite to a house party in the mountains on a lake. Many of my friends were going, and I couldn't miss it. Soon after that party, I had found my life's mission, my purpose, my journey. It was dark. Lake Anna was nearly two miles in circumference, lined with tall, skinny pines. Two lights were at play. The moon was up, dimmed by lacy, translucent clouds, and there was a perimeter light on a flagpole at the far side of the lake. I was swaying on a rocking chair, I think, but maybe it was just a rocking chair. Or standing. I don't really know. I was in a state of euphoria. Paint by numbers morning sky looks so phony. Not completely accurate. I was staring at the ripples on the lake. The water, the water, the water. The distant perimeter light bounced beams of white off the lake. The pines dark on the other side. The blue moon light at rest on the lake's ripples, changing in aesthetic pastels and slow motion waves. A wooden dock in front of me, like I'm about to speed down it on snow skis, rocking. Somewhere in this concoction of thoughts and euphoria, my brain was imprinted with those ripples. Ripples reflecting light equal euphoria. The sound of my friends swung by me, rocking. The warm air in that part of the country lasts all night. You can sit naked on a dock and rock in a static chair. Play dead albums in your head. Your arms wave accordingly and stare at the ripples as they turn orange, pink, purple, and blue with the music. Rocking. The sensation in the gut is too strong. Friends running. People yelling. Joe in my face. We're swimming to the island. More running. People not unlike blurs of color. Sound to my left and to my other left. Like color. Anna. Ashore, come with me. Come swimming with me. We're going to the island. I find myself at the end of a wooden dock. A wooden duck. Where am I? I jump in. The water is in slow motion. I am in slow motion. Bubbles. Bubbles everywhere. My euphoric peace and interest gone. Now, there is only silence knocking at my creative brain. What's this do something sensation? Do what? I watch the chaos of water about me, a splash there, a single bubble in dark space, all in deliberate and lingering motion, an image of Anna's face. I can hear her shout my name and my name again. Help! She shouts. A shore needs help! She's frantic. Swim! Footnote. List. 
a lean of a vessel caused by internal forces, like unbalanced cargo. Heel would serve as a better word here, though it doesn't resonate as nicely. Heel is a lean caused by external forces, like wind. 79. Bumfuck. A proper noun, and I'll fucking fight you if you say otherwise. Used here to denote a sense of bottled anger towards the backwoods and outdated culture of my childhood home, Goochland County, Virginia. 80. See The Grateful Dead's Touch of Grey. Yawn 42. Seaman Apprentice Avani. We established a working relationship. I'd give him rides every so often and he'd buy me liquor for the training center's fishing dock. In late spring and early summer, rolling thunder showers would appear almost daily, in and out within a few minutes. Humidity was as high as the temperature, 95, 100 degrees. Driving down the back roads paralleling the river, I'd have to whack Avani's hand away from my AC controls. I want to feel the air I'm driving in. One unfortunate aspect of my experience in the Coast Guard was a communal lack of excitement for the neighboring world. On the central coast, Mayan pyramids were near every port call. A quick hop, skip, and jump would have landed a flock of my shipmates in an ancient wonderland. Other port calls had similar destinations. Each and every moment, the world went by, and my friends and superiors found close bars to make it go by in a blur. Driving through the old battlefield in that part of Virginia, my interest was sparked, and Avani seemed to be up for a history lesson. A History of the York River Various tribes of Indians traversed the York River, heading to the Chesapeake in sleek canoes under paddle. The Powhatan go down on record as the first settlers, only because that's what the first English settlers decided to record. It's dumb to think there were no other groups here before the 16th century Indians. Otherwise, we know that the rivers of Virginia and the Chesapeake were inhabited by a multitude of other groups of Indians. By the very first decade of the 17th century, the English settled nearby. Their ships were much larger, but not as sleek. Originally in Jamestown, a short five miles from Yorktown, on the James River, the first English settlers lacked the skills and knowledge needed to survive in the low swamplands of Virginia. They started dying off, and by sheer force of numbers, one ship after another for 200 years, they beat their death lot. Immediately, they went to work on agriculture. The York River became a more useful port due to its depths, and Yorktown was established and became a tobacco center. Over the next few decades, the Norfolk, Jamestown, Yorktown area became the hub of trade for the English in the New World. Williamsburg was established. By 1680s, the problem of pirates became a reality for Virginia. Pirates were flourishing due to the bad economy, new technology, and chaotic and sparse enforcement of law and order. Edward Teat used the York River as a staging area for sacks on nearby villages. He even confessed to burying treasure at the mouth of the river. This, plus Drake's account, is one of the few documented cases of pirates actually burying treasure. Just off the present-day public dock in Yorktown, Teach, aka Blackbeard, would sail his gun-decked ships under the cover of dark and pick off weary travelers. Fast forward 100 years, and the Allies and British forces were bombarding each other. Yorktown Battlefield shows the pure idiocy of the 18th century fighting, and though it is shameful to see, it is a perfect representation of an officer class puppeteering an enlisted militia class in the name of honor and style. Washington, of course, won the day here, and the new Virginians, used to be English, were freed to release their own kind of wrath on the old world Virginians, Indians. The river kept flowing, and soon there was another tremendous battle this time in the 1860s. The states couldn't agree on their constitution's language, and the southern states established their own constitution. While both states saw their own kind, white people with penises, as superior, the North was mad at the South because the South enslaved black people. Instead of defending its institution, the South defended its rights to create its own laws, i.e. enslaving black people. The North sent a flotilla of ships to blockade all southern ports and to blow up all southern boatyards. In the Chesapeake, there were numerous narrow deep water channels available for the Confederacy to build and protect their ships. They set sail their first ironclad steam-powered ship from the James River and sent a smaller fleet down the York River to cause a distraction. From our vantage point in Yorktown, we would have seen black men being whipped in the cotton fields and heard thunder from the gun battle miles away. Fifty years later, and the Union had established its largest naval base at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. 
Another 50 years go by and fishing fleets, recreational fleets, cargo and tanker fleets all move in and out of the Chesapeake Bay and her rivers. Avani and I sip Jack and on the banks of the muddy York, think about it all. Footnote, 81, port call, a temporary stay of a vessel while on a prolonged deployment. 82, gun deck. One, to manipulate or lie on a ship's log. Two, originally to create fake gun portals on the side of a ship to trick the enemy into thinking you have more guns than you actually do. 83, ironclad. Built in the mid-19th century, they were put to use first and successfully by the Confederates in 1861, a steam-powered wood ship covered in iron armor. Yawn 43, Fireman Red. The entire thing was a side gig for Red. A moment before class and a moment after, he switched modes from Coasty to Red. It was impressive, I have to admit. Born in Virginia, about an hour from my hometown, Red had a social network established and he drove an hour home after school each day. His fiance worked at a local Hooters near the naval base in Norfolk. And when the invitation was open, We'd all head that way after class to stare at her boobs and sneak vodka into our drinks. Not that Red would condone such a thing. He was adamant about staying out of our drama. He wouldn't buy us booze, and he wouldn't hang out if we began to get rowdy. There was something to learn from Red. I was too naive to figure it out. He served on a buoy tender before our school. He and I were one of the few who had spent any time operationally in the Coast Guard. Everyone else in the class was straight out of boot. As a Black Hawk Coastie, a term for Coast Guardsmen serving on buoy tenders and Aton units, Red stories were all about mishaps. Anchor block not secured to the deck. Chain broke free during David Ops. Buoy drifted station into the breakers. Boat hit buoy. Wave broke over work deck and sent him and friends washing towards the gunnels. I listened with great intrigue and tried to picture myself on a Black Hawk. There was no fantasy there for me. My imagination forced open sea, law enforcement, or, under stress, third world gutters, cage, and sorrow. Footnote 84. Aton. Aid to navigation. Buoy, lighthouse, dayboard, etc. 85. Gunnel. The side of a ship that transcends the height of the hull and deck. The term is the corruption of gun and whale. The first in reference to a ship's cannon, and the second to the side planks of a ship, whale. Literally, the place on a ship's side where the gun rests. Journal entry. Dana describing the struggles of a sailor by bunking in the forecastle was like a 19th century psychologist describing the struggles of a prostitute by measuring her skull. And with his measurements, he went home to his old money and prestigious institutions, wrote poetry, reflecting on his meager moment as a working man, was awarded for his poems, wrote manuals for mariners, maritime terminology, maritime law, was awarded for his views, buddied up with the educated and the wealthy, was awarded with friends in those places. If money is a measure of success, Dana was born successful. What a stupid way to measure success. If experience is a measure of success, Dana's was as an impersonator. His famous reflection was based on a pseudo-experience. Ha! What a stupid weight. If being swept away with life and a feverish splendor is a measure of success, maybe Dana was hot for it on the Pilgrim, or maybe more so on the Alert. He certainly couldn't let it go. Yawn 44. Rambo. Fireman. The thought of two more years in the guard was unbearable. After the thrill, I felt worthless and had regrets about enlisting. Watching the other guys have all the fun was too much for me. If I went back to a ship as an engineer, an MK, I would never be on a boarding team or a law enforcement team, and I would probably never serve in operations. Mechanic school offered very few options for adventure-seeking sailors, and I began to feel defeat. A fifth of Jack in his gut, no vomit, carried on with his evening. At 5'11", 205 pounds, Rambo was solid muscle. With an idol like Arnold Schwarzenegger, nothing from Rambo should have been a surprise to me. But, as it unfolded, it was. When I first met him in Yorktown, Rambo wore a white undershirt with the words, Rambo Rules, written on it in black magic marker. He wore the same shirt each day the MK1 allowed us to report in civvies. 
There wasn't too much time to socialize during the days, though afterwards, those of us who were single headed out to the nearest bar. Being underage, Rambo and I had to develop an elaborate way of sneaking in. When successful, we'd continue to that bar each night to establish trust with the bartender. And there, Rambo and our friends were, at a pool hall in Norfolk, drinking and enjoying each evening in peace. One particular night at our bar, we had a bottle of Jack. Always the antagonizer, Rambo was pressuring us to drink quickly. Between the three of us, we were shit-faced before the bartender served us around. I wanted to finish the night early, so I put a cap on the evening and caroused everyone into my truck. I was anxious about doing well at the unit's physical fitness test and run the next morning. It would either open doors or limit options of which units we'd get orders to after school. Driving through the dense tree-lined curvy road seemed to be a challenge. The oncoming headlamps were not as bad as the two obnoxious passengers making boisterous jokes of everything. Rambo handed me the bottle. I can't, man, I'll puke. Both passengers started chanting, Chug, chug. As always, I folded under the peer pressure, grabbed the bottle, and killed its contents. It went down, mixed with a bunch of beer foam, and started rising fast in the back of my throat. Grab the wheel! I yelled as I rolled down the window. I kept my foot on the gas, pushing about 50 miles per hour on a busy back road in the dark, and I leaned as far out as I could and puked in the wind. Returning to the wheel, I could feel the slime all over my cheeks and chin. Looking down, I could see it actively drip off my face onto my shirt. We can't go through the ID check on base like this, I moaned to my laughing passengers. While inside a 7-Eleven, looking for some paper towels and cleaner, a cop pulled up and placed his headlights on my truck. We walked out of the store and tried to play it cool. Where are you guys headed to tonight? I worried the Virginian cop was going to harass us due to my California plates, so I said my hometown, Hoochland. As I said this, I started hiccuping. Everyone was silent. And who's driving? Oh, uh, I'm driving. I volunteered. The cop shook his head. Be safe out there, fellas. There's a lot of bad drivers this time of night. And it walked away. I quickly scrubbed the chunks off the side of the truck and we took off for base. My sights were set on new units within the Coast Guard, MLEUs. They were supposed to be the combat units of the Guard, newly established by the DHS after 9-11. Lots of training and lots of deployments, and the possibility of going overseas. At A school, I exercised harder than ever, in hopes of landing orders to MLEU, and Rambo was a natural partner in this endeavor, as he had a workout regiment down. The morning after I vomited out the truck window, we woke at 0600 to a physical test. This included a mile and a half run and a bunch of sit-ups and push-ups. Walking to the start line, I kneeled behind a parked car and hurled. I was sure my gut would rip open. As I threw up, Rambo laughed. During the run, he finished first, and I came in nearly last. This difference in body mechanics plagued me for a long time. I was often around alcoholics who were 100% functional during and after a night of complete debauchery. After six rounds, my brain turns off, memory fails, and I wake up in strange places having done some of the most unbelievable things anyone could do. I am an animal on alcohol. This failed run was due to drinking. This failed run set me at the second to last spot on the list for post-graduation unit choices. I was devastated, and I stumbled back to the barracks to continue puking and sit in sorrow at the bottom of the shower. Weeks later, when orders came out, I was second to last to pick out of 30 classmates. There were two units that fit the description of MLEUs where I wanted to go, one in Miami and one in San Francisco. The likelihood of me getting one of these positions was nothing. The possibility of me getting sent to a cutter or a buoy tender in the Great Lakes or Alaska or the Mississippi River were high. I felt like shit, and I sat at muster as the MKC went through the roster of names. Holy shit! With three units left, at place 27 on the list, there was still an MLEU available. No one wanted to go to a law enforcement unit. But of course, number 28 took the spot. The last two billets were on the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Mackinac in upstate Michigan, a buoy tender. At least there will be heavy drinkers there. I meandered my way to my berth one last time. The following day was graduation, and we were expected to be in full dress uniform to go through that ceremony. Before our last morning muster, I was called to the MKC's office along with one other shipmate, the number 30 on the list, the guy who did even worse than me. 
We were a little worried and thought our poor grades in class were going to get us in trouble. When the chief said that number 28 was having his orders revoked because he was caught cheating and that his orders were open for us to pick, I almost shit. Without thought, I yelled, I'll take him. In an instant, my life course changed and I was going to an elite team in the Coast Guard. I would get my adventure after all. The new orders were for San Francisco, and I was more than eager to go, even though I'd sworn off California from my days on the thrill. Rambo had orders to that base too, as a shoreside engineer for the Cutter's home port it there. We were going to be seeing a lot of each other. In the meantime, I needed to sober up and prep myself for my new unit. I parted ways with my A-school comrades, and off I went for a second 30-day solo vacation. Journal Entry, October 2004 I made it through Yellowstone yesterday. I arrived at night and was driving before 8 this morning. I'm at some gas station in Oregon now. Some asshole won't let me pump my own gas. He greeted me at the pump when I was clearing out all my piss bottles. The things you can learn on the road, go figure. A billboard in Mississippi taught me Samuel Clemens' pen name, Mark Twain, means barely navigable waters. On the Mississippi, where he was a pilot, a leadsman would shout the term at two fathoms, which I guess would be shallow for the vessels Twain was driving. Those Missourians know nothing about Jack London. His name is better. It was John London. London taken from his stepfather. John's biological father left his mother while she was pregnant with John. She shot herself in the head, while pregnant, at the thought of being a single mother in the horribly religious, judgmental era of the 19th century. Jack finished the job 40 years later with the help of alcohol and morphine and a roller coaster of a life.